difficult assignment to a session which is after lunch, which is known by the professional schmoozers as the graveyard session. And uh, Danny Gillerman always have a story about uh, when he gave a talk at this session and somebody fall asleep, fall asleep in the first row. And Danny told the guy next to him, can you wake him up? So the guy looked at him and said, you made him sleep, you wake him up. Okay, we are going to spend the next 50 minutes about trying to find what can we learn from Israel about how to create innovative and creative environment. Next to me is Avi Shlush. You have Shlush. Why I called you Avi Shlush? Because your father, right. And uh, let us first start with the fact that your family is somehow related to this neighborhood. Can you share with us, which was another type of entrepreneurship? Yeah, it was. Thank you very much, Yossi. It's a pleasure to be here. So probably 150 years ago, uh, the whole Jewish community of this area was in Jaffa. The town got to be too small, too cramped, and too unhealthy. So they decided, my family decided to create the first settlement, which is next to us, called Neve Tzedek. And the way they did that is they bought the land from an Arab. And the way you would do it is you would first negotiate the price. Once you had the price, you'd go to the plot, you'd throw a stone, and that would define the circle. That was a radius that would define the circle of the plot you bought. So my great-great-grandfather practiced for half a year stone throwing before he pitched it. And he bought the land, and he basically came to all his neighbors and suggested that he would give them the land for free under one condition, which is that they would build a house within one year. And that, that then the plot would, be, plot would be theirs for free. And for years in my family, we grew around the story that he was such a great entrepreneur and the benevolent who really created the whole of Neve Tzedek with his own money. Uh, until we discovered some time ago that he was the sole provider of building materials. Uh, so, so there was a twist. It's never quite what you think it is. <laughs> And then after that, they built this uh, train station, uh, which connected to Jerusalem. It took four years to build the whole railway system. And we have not been able in the following 100 years to uh, re recreate this engineering feat of having a railway from here to Jerusalem. But that's another story. Good. And the name of your grand, 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 grandfather was? Uh, he was uh, Haron Shlush. Not Yosef Eliyahu Shlush? His son. He was the one who built Tel Aviv, the next, uh, ah. the next session, right? Good. Yoav Shlush is one of Israeli veteran entrepreneurs. When did you start your career as an entrepreneur? Um, now, <laughs> in 1980. 1980? In Cytex, yeah. Right. And Yoav is now the head of, what is the name of your organization this week? We, we, <laughs> we have a high-tech organization which tries to cover the whole ecosystem in Israel. It's called IATI, that's the name of the week. Uh, Israel Advanced Technology Industries, uh, and we put in it together startups, the multinational corporations who, are, who have R&D centers here, service providers, technology transfer organizations, and more to follow. Now, this is supposed to be an interactive session. Only do you have a roving uh, microphone at the audience? You have, good. So anybody who think that he has something to say, Raise your hand and we will be very interested to hear what you say. Yoav, let me ask you a very original question. What is going on in this place that 8.2 million people are creating 6,000 startups that the best... You are left without microphone? No. Okay. He cannot talk without microphone. Okay. It works. Can you hear me? Good. Yeah. So what is here that 6,000 startups are existing here that uh, Apple and Facebook and uh, IBM and Broadcom and Qualcomm, and AOL, and Microsoft, and Google, and uh, whom else I forgot? 
Cisco, HP, HP. Intel, Intel, Intel 9,500 people. By, by the way, the list is 250 names long, so I don't think you want to wait for all of them. Yeah, we will, we will, we will uh, mention all of them. So how do you explain it? Uh, it must be either the quality of the water or we just can't hold an honest job down, so we end up inventing stuff, inventing problems. I think part of it has to do that after the first entrepreneurs really got to be very successful, all of a sudden jealousy walks in and we are a very jealous society. So if my neighbor can do that, well, I can surely do better. And I think you start having a ripple effect that takes care of that. Other than that, it's a mystery to me. By the way, I found another thing which exists here doesn't exist in other countries. So this is the variable which can explain. And this is Bamba. You know, this is the only country sure. where young guys <laughs> are eating Bamba. So probably the, the thing is... Uh, yes, the, the, there is another unique component and I want to tell it to the audience here. And that is we are the only country in the world that has a Yossi Vardi. And I want you to stand up and give him a round of applause. Nobody can do this like he did. So please. He, let me tell you something with all honesty. He couldn't say it on a, on a nicer guy. Actually, actually, I tried to bet with somebody that I will once be able to render him speechless and I failed again. So. <laughs> okay, so jealousy is one... Yeah, I, or, I, or maybe, maybe we can, on the positive side, call it role models. It, 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 yeah. Well, that, that's you becoming the nice guy. It, it, it is role models. In, in, in our society, the role models used to be that, uh, um, you know, there's this uh, lady who walks with a stroller and she has twins in, in Tel Aviv. And she meets one of her friends. And the friend said, oh, what lovely babies you've got. Who of them is the engineer and who's the doctor? Or the lawyer and the doctor, if you will. So that, those roles have now changed. So the assumption is that now both of them are going to be entrepreneurs. Um, so, so definitely we've institutionalized the drive that what has happened here over time, through successes, through failures, through jealousy, through the role modeling, is that entrepreneurship has become a mainstream op occupation here. And I think that's very rare. It's not obvious. It didn't used to be like that. And, and now that it's a bona fide occupation, if you will, uh, things are sort of t taking, taking uh, uh, their own momentum and uh, it's, it's building one on top of the other. The other thing I think is, is, is we're bored. I mean, we're in a part of the world where nothing happens. Our neighbors are perfectly nice to us. Um, no agitation, no room for excitement. So at least on the professional side, try something new. Uh, you have, other than being great entrepreneur, you worked with, I think, probably the greatest entrepreneur which we knew in recent years. Can you, for the benefit of the guys who didn't kn knew him, can you tell us a little bit about him? Uh, with pleasure. So for the sake of history, uh, the fa one of the leading entrepreneurs in the history of this country who really helped create the industry uh, was a guy called Efi Harazi. Uh, born in Jerusalem, who started his life as a total misfit. He couldn't hold on a position in any school you could think of and uh, was admitted to MIT under some freak program that they had for crazy people. And then worked for NASA. Uh, he, he told them that he was graduate of the Institute of Technology of the Air Force, you know, yeah. which was... <laughs> yes, which, which was a technical high school for kids who weren't strong, good enough to go through their uh, regular program. And then he came back to Israel and started a company called Cytex. And the first mission was to become a defense contractor, which is something he knew something about, trying to create systems for the defense establishment here. That was the only buyer of technology at the time. That was strategy number one. Strategy number two was how do we avoid bankruptcy? Because the defense department never paid its bills. And then they moved on to digital imaging, created a wonderful uh, company called Cytex, which grew at its peak to 5,000 employees. And he was a self-taught entrepreneur, uh, one of a kind, and many of us are his intellectual children, if you will. I think uh, Effie created here uh, a whole uh, generation of entrepreneurs just by the role model he played. And another thing which we should mention here, the endless charisma, which is another thing I think which is very important. Oh yeah, the, the gentleman was blessed with looks, charisma, 
uh, the ability to charm anybody around, whether it was an employee, a customer, or a banker. At that time, that was important. There were no VCs around, so you had to go to banks. Uh, and uh, it was a God-given God gift, and uh, it was wonderful to work with him and for him. Um, he also had a w wonderful way of learning new things, uh, which I've learned from him in many ways. He said, he used to tell me every time, I, I love to learn, I hate to be taught which is why he never went to the regular sources of knowledge, but always tried to look for original things. And um, he also told me one more thing. He always copied from the entry-level rank in the organization. He always said, the people who know most about what we're doing or what, where we need to go are either the salespeople in the field or the engineers who just finished their schooling, because they are the freshest. Okay, so you say that in his uh, time there were no VCs. No VCs. No VCs. Beautiful period in Can life. Can you right? repeat <laughs> this saying again? The term VC was not no, known. No VC. There no were no VCs, no and VC. the word exit did not exist in, the can in, in, in our vocabulary, actually. Do no th you think this was an advantage or disadvantage? It, it, the industry was so small that in hindsight, without VCs, we wouldn't be able to grow the industry. So we have to take the good with the bad. Uh, so the good news was that the people who invested in him never thought they'd sell their shares and thought that they were joining a trip into forever. Uh, the bad news is that there wasn't an industry. It was one, two, three, four, five companies. So you got to take both sides. And I know what you think about VCs, but nevertheless. You don't know anything. What do you know what I think? I think what I think, you know. Okay, so uh, you say uh, that jealousy is the motive power. We know there is more for it. It looked like that Israel is very good in the early stages of the innovation when it comes to scaling or to marketing. Uh, it's more, uh, more challenging. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and, and it might go, let me connect it to one more thing about why people go here into entrepreneurship and that kind of thing and why we find it indeed hard to scale. We have a DNA problem in this country. For those of you who are not Israelis, let me warn you. We hate Just a minute. Who is in the audience not Israeli? Raise your hand. Who from the people who are not Israeli has an investment in Israel or work for a company which has an investment in Israel? Raise your hand. So all the, all, all so the, the non-Israelis are innocent people. Good. They don't have any... So, Any so, experience. Okay, so here, here's, a here's a small warning. On, on, on the, I hope my Israeli colleagues will agree with me. We really have a DNA problem in this country, which is we cannot accept or deal with discipline and hierarchy. We can't take it. And people on the outside are fooled because we have a big army and you assume that the army is about discipline, not over here. So the, the, the point is quite simple. For 2,000 years, the Jewish people were spread out throughout the world. So for 2,000 years, we did not have a king, and we did not have a pope or a high priest. So it took us 2,000 years to get used to the fact that you can do pretty well, with, well without hierarchy, and we're still there. And that helps. It helps because in high-tech organizations, there is a difference between the organizational hierarchy and the knowledge hierarchy. Even in our army, very often you could see somebody who everybody goes to who is the mentor, and what is great in the organization doesn't matter. But he's like the number one in his in his field. Now, having said that, that also poses a problem when you try to scale up, because scaling up requires some level of discipline, some level of structure, some level of process, and this is where we don't necessarily do our best. Having said that, we do have a few companies already on the horizon that are trying to break the barrier to get to the billion dollar level uh, and, and to move from there onwards. Um, you know, companies like um, Object, trying to deal with 3D, 3D printing. You mean trying, they are dealing, not trying to deal. Trying to break the billion dollar barrier, right. Which was the first uh, Israeli company who tried uh, to spin off a uh, 3D modeling company? It was Cytex that we were <laughs> part of. The first company can in, you, can in 3D printing. Can you share printing. with us the experience? In, absolutely, thank you for asking. The, the, the first company in Israel in 3D printing which was, was, was one of the two in the world. Which was one, there were two in the world, one in California and one in Israel. There are many areas where you have one company in California and one in Israel. A company called Cubital, 
which tried to create a fast, cheap, first ever 3D printer. Not cheap. The printer cost a million and a half dollars. We didn't get Not to cheap. the design goal. Half a million, half a million. The, the company was led by an unbelievable chairman at the time. His name is Yossi Vardi. And I, I remember you uh, perf- uh, trying to get them to go to market in a, in, in a, in a good way. Uh, so he had the looks and he had the drive. No, no, no. First I had of the founder all, we share have, and we lost the company. First of all, we have to give a credit to the guy who is really genius, Itzik Pomeranz, who saw this market really 20 years before anybody else. 